Hello and welcome to Through the Telescope, the podcast that puts the lens on astronomy. I'm Rose Waugh and I'm an astrophysicist and science communicator. And I'm Elliot Bruce and I'm neither of those things, but I'll be trying to find out why we should even care about astronomy. We'll be exploring some of the big topics in the field in little manageable pieces and have some fun along the way. So, whether you know your red lines from your red shifts, or you're not quite sure what the difference between astronomy and astrology actually is, join us as we launch ourselves into the cosmos and try not to burn up on re-entry. Through the Telescope is sponsored by Pic Astro, the astronomy and astrophotography image sharing app, dedicated to your images of the cosmos no matter what stage you are on your journey around the universe. No ads, spam, or fake accounts. Today, we're talking about the sun. Yeah. I've seen the sun. It's quite important. Only ever seen it in the daytime. Don't look at it directly. <laughs> um, public health announcement. No, public safety announcement. That's the one. It's pretty big. Yeah. How big are we talking? Well, in the episode about the solar system, we, we chatted about how the the solar system is about one point zero zero one solar masses, or masses of the sun. So, in that sense, you know, relative to the solar system, it's absolutely ginormous. But I suppose you mean relative to other stars. I guess I was thinking more in terms of relative to us, but other stars also make sense. Yeah. I mean, is it a big star? No. Oh. <laughs> no, it's a pretty small star, really. Um, but most stars in the universe are quite small. We talked about that as well. Mm. Um, in one of the previous episodes, smaller stars are far more common in the universe than than bigger stars. So it's, it's pretty common in that sense. Right. Um, but yeah, from our point of view, it's huge. So, if you wanted to put Earth inside of it, you want to, you wanted to fill it with Earths. Mm. You need one point three million Earths. Now, as a chemist, as a structural chemist, I'm wondering. Whenever you hear these figures, you're like, oh yeah, but it would fit one point three million Earths inside. Mm-hmm. I reckon Volume. that's just in terms of like, oh, the Earth is one cubic meter i reckon it's more than one cubic meter um and then they've just divided it because as a chemist trying to stack spheres together oh yeah they've taken the volume (laughs) of the of the sun and they've divided by the volume of earth yeah to find how many they're not saying if the earth stayed as a sphere (laughs) Yeah. How many could you fit in? Although I think, to be honest, the reality is going to be not too significantly different. Of Probably not. An no. answer. <laughs> but it's just you know when they say one point three million Earths, they like really squidged those Earths in. You know, you know what I mean? Yes. Thought for the day. <laughs> but I suspect that you wouldn't need to because the the gravitational oh it does it force itself. of the sun yeah it would. Yeah. All of that mass, it would just rearrange itself. I remember looking before at what would happen if you had a mole, 6.02 times 10 to the 23 moles, as in the creature. And the thing I found with the internet was that there would be a horrible gravitational effect and the centre would just be a sort of meaty mass. That Moving on. like someone procrastinating <laughs> from exam revision. I think that's exactly what was going on. Yeah, that um, does not surprise me. So, basically, the sun is not not that big. It's, it's relatively small. Compared to the Earth, it's very big. Compared to some of the biggest stars that we know, the very biggest stars, you know, one, one of these really humongous stars would be about 2,000 times 
the radius of the sun. Right. So then that's like 2,000 cubed, presumably, for the volume. Yeah. So it's going to be humongous. Yes. So it all depends on... It's all relative. So in that sense, the sun is really tiny. It's simultaneously tiny and mahusive. Um, yes. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I think I think so, pretty comprehensively. Um, it's big, but it's also small. Yeah. So how old is it? Uh, well, again, relatively. <laughs> <laughs> From my point of view, really old, ancient. 4.5 billion years old. That's probably my point of view as well, because I'm nowhere near my 4.5 billion year birthday. birthday. Yeah. yeah. Um, but from the point of view of a solar-like star, a star like the sun, it's just kind of middle-aged, really. Okay. Kind of, um, yeah, just chugging along nicely. I think that's something we can all aspire to. Yes, Yep. I wonder if there are any listeners that would also classify <laughs> themselves as chugging along <laughs> nicely at their middle age. So, that being said, that it's uh, it's nicely middle aged, and it's um, it's really big. I guess it's more the kind of the size I'm thinking of here. Mm-hmm. What kind of if I could walk on the moon, which sounds kind of at the moon. If I could walk on the sun, which sounds like some kind of movie title or something. Mm. Sounds like yeah. a yeah, that would it's be a, a musical, good maybe. Yeah, walking on or sunshine. A good book, I think. If I could walk on the sun. Yeah. That'd be a good novel. Yeah. How it's massive, so I'm guessing that I am experiencing some quite high G's at this point. Mm. Smushed to smithereens really, I think. I guess do I just fall through? Or I I don't even have time to think about it because I'm being Roasted alive and crushed simultaneously, presumably. Yeah, I think you're crushed, really, before you can wander very much, really. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have much time to think. Yes, walking on it is pretty difficult because defining the surface of the sun is a bit tricky. Okay. Um, because the sun is made of plasma, mm. so plasma is um, ionised gas. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, there are four four states of matter. Well, quantum physicists would disagree with me, but in in the normal world, yeah, <laughs> there are four states of matter: solid, liquid, gas. We're all pretty happy with them. Yeah. Plasma is the fourth. Mm. It's like it's like a gas, but it's highly ionized. Yeah, which means it's had its electrons stripped off of the of the atoms. Yeah. That it's, it's made of. I've always kind of thought of it kind of like a sort of, if you know about metals and a sea of electrons, when I've ever heard people talk about it, I've kind of envisaged it as kind of like a gas metal almost because you've got your positively yeah. charged nuclei yeah. and then electrons that are not attached just kind of mm-hmm. smearing around. Yeah. It's pretty fun stuff I was going to say to work with, but I mean theoretically. I mean, don't know about physically working with it, but it's you know it's quite quite fun. It's quite a cool concept mm. or um, part of the physical world, I suppose. But we we diverge. That's what plasma is for anyone who's not aware of what plasma is. Mm. But because of that, it's you know. You can imagine it's kind of difficult to define the surface of something. Yes. Um, the, if you if you go deep enough into the sun, it is, is a solid. But generally, um, it's quite common to take the surface of the sun to be at the photosphere, which is just um, a region of the sun, you know, like think of the earth and how we talk about different parts of its atmosphere yeah we do a similar thing on the sun okay um and basically that's often where you would take the surface to be if you wanted to know how strong the gravity is there that would be about 28 g's so 28 times the gravity that you experience on earth 
Well. So, so quite a lot. Yes. Really. I mean... I think it's also hard to kind of comprehend that because in some ways 28 doesn't sound massive, mm. you know. But when you kind of stop to think about it, 28 times the force that you feel just on Earth is actually quite a lot. Yeah. Well beyond what the <laughs> body can cope with. Yeah, does a rocket launch get you up to like 10 Gs or something like that? I feel like you can't get too many Gs before you just... Yeah. yeah. You'd also, you'd look like one of those dogs... I imagine. Like a yeah. basset hound, is it? With the kind of... Yeah. It's like when you see uh, yeah, I don't know why I'm doing that, because no one can see this, which for, is not a bad thing. For the listeners, <laughs> um, Ro just um, sort of <laughs> jiggled. <laughs> jiggled your face flesh with your hands. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a technical term. Um, yeah. If you want to jiggle along at home... <laughs> I see. So, I mean, given that we've already had enough of an issue saying where the surface of the sun is, Mm -hmm. I guess this might sound kind of weird, but so when we think about planets, planets spin around. That's how days happen. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing the sun spins around because everything spins around, right? Yes. So, does the sun have a day, or does that make no sense whatsoever because there isn't a sun for the sun to spin around, if you know what I mean? Right, yes. Yes, so when you think about um, the Earth or any kind of rocky planet-type object, the idea of it spinning around its own axis, which is what a day is, is quite... Um, normal, like it's mm-hmm. it's not. Um, it doesn't raise any mental challenges. I suppose is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Because it it participates, for want of a better word, in what we would call solid body rotation. So it is solid and it rotates. So it's very obvious. Yes. How that rotation is is happening. Yes. If you take something like the sun, which, as you've pointed out, is made of a plasma, it's not solid, not solid all the way through, defining a similar kind of rotation is not so... it, It becomes a bit more mentally challenging. Yeah. The sun rotates because, like you say, most, you know, everything in the universe has some sense of rotation about its own axis which comes from how it's formed. Conservation of angular momentum, if you're going to... So it started spinning and it's still spinning. Yes. So it started spinning when it formed into itself from all of the bits of it that Mm. were just floating around. And, like you say, it started spinning, so it will keep spinning. Mm -hmm. With the sun, because it's not solid... The sun rotates in a way that we would call differential rotation. Right. Which means that the way that it rotates at its equator... Right. ...at its waistline, if you like... Yeah. ...is not the same as the speed that its pole rotates at. Right, so this is when you're saying that, you know, on a rocky planet, that doesn't make any sense kind of thing, we know, things Mm -hmm. rotate and that's it. That would be like saying Iceland is moving around slower than, say, Egypt. Yes. Um, Right. (laughs) And this differential rotation is actually very important for the sun. Um, But it, it makes it more challenging to define such a thing as a day on the sun. I mean, first of all, everyone's brain is probably already fried by the idea that we're trying to talk about a day on the sun. Yeah. When Should we call it a rotational period us, or something? To us, a day is kind of something that the Earth experiences because of the sun. Yes. You know what I mean? But really, by day, we're talking about its, its orbital rotation. 
Yeah. So if you stood in some miraculous way mm. at the equator on the sun, then it would take you 25 days to go all the way around in a circle back to, to where you started. Right, so that's at the equator. If you instead stood at the pole, yeah. or you know, very close to the pole, it's going to take you 36 days to get back. That's a big difference. To where you started, yes. Also, I'm just imagining standing at the top of the sun and just, like, sl- slowly my face is looking in a different direction. Yes. There. Um, and it would take you 36 days to geez. look back in the direction that you were originally looking at. So you think time zones are bad on the Earth? Yeah. I mean, Imagine we if we different were... calendars and things. <laughs> like, would that happen if we were, like, an ocean planet? You know well, I, mean? I like guess if we, we kind of are an ocean planet, but yes, I think that we also would have to not have a moon. Right. I think. And also, we'd have to be, I suppose, a fully, fully ocean planet, because I imagine that, you know, the, the land masses that we currently have, they also will influence how the water will move about the surface. Because if you've got, like, a sort of a reef or something, even, yeah. And if we've not got any land masses, what are we making the boats out of? So many questions. Yeah. Yeah. Kelp, maybe. (laughs) Nice. So, yeah, basically the answer to, you know, how long is a day on the sun is anywhere between 25 and 36 days, depending on where you're at, depending on your latitude... I would say that the rotational period of the sun is 28 days. Is that like a sort of... Um, it's just kind of, I guess, like a, some sort of... Weighted average. average. Is maybe a, a wrong word, but yeah. Um, when I work with rotation periods of stars and I compare it to the sun or whatever, I would say the sun is about 28 days. But those same things are going on with different stars then? So. Yeah, all stars have differential rotation. And it's a thing that is measured um, on other stars because it is, you know, as I said, it's it's an important part of the, the sun and stars. Um, so if you care about the, mag- the magnetic fields of mm. stars, which you should because they're cool and they're important for the star... Um, then you might want to know about how that magnetic field is evolving Mm. um, and how strong it is and things like this. And the way that stars make more magnetic fields and regenerate their magnetic field so that they, you know, always have some. Right. And and so that it can evolve into different different shapes and, and whatever is related to the differential rotation because any magnetic field line that's you know at the equator is traveling at a different speed to yes a magnetic field line that's nearer the pole so if you were to think of drawing a magnetic loop just like literally like a loop okay and you said one foot one part of my field line that comes out from the sun at the equator Mm -hmm. then has to close back to the sun. Right. And it passes through somewhere near the pole. Okay. Then you have two, what you would call, feet of your field lines. Okay. And that's just where the field line passes through the surface of the sun or the star. So you're drawing a big loop from the equator out and round into the pole. Yes. Kind of. Pole might be a bad use of the word in this case. <laughs> yes. But... When you have originally drawn that, they're going to be in line with each other. Yes. But as the star rotates, that does not continue to be the case. Right. Because the the one near the equator, it starts to, to go in front of the one at the pole. Do you see? Yes, that mean? doesn't seem good. You're so, then going to get... It's going to go... It's going to get stretched further and further and further round as time goes on, and then... yeah. 
I don't even know what happens at that point. Yeah. The sun so, breaks. So field lines get stretched and twisted, and this is how more magnetic field is then generated. Right. Um, and, yeah, like you say, sometimes it um, gets too twisted and too stretched, and that results in, you know, explosive forms of activity on the star. When you say make more magnets, <laughs> that's not what you said. <laughs> uh, when you say make more magnetic fields or something, mm -hmm. I thought, well, I don't really know what I thought. I thought um, your field was your field. Is that what it was? What? That was a question. <laughs> <laughs> not quite sure exactly what the question was, I apart guess, from mean, confused, which is perfectly reasonable. And um, I'm going to be honest, almost every conference I've been to mm. in my life as as an astronomer, um, and also, you know, seminars and lectures as well and stuff like that, a lot of astronomers, like, you put the fear of God into them by mentioning magnetic fields. Okay. And I think it's also true... In physics as well. I don't think it's just astrophysics. Um, magnetic fields make people feel uncomfortable. Okay. I think they give people bad <laughs> memories of their undergrad years for a start. They're just kind of complex and they can be very difficult to model. When you so, say complex, you mean difficult involved as opposed to imaginary? Yes, difficult Don't tell involved. me you can get imaginary fields as well. <laughs> You're not saying no. <laughs> no, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think what that would mean. I mean, I, I would say no, but I don't know everything about magnetic fields. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, no, I guess I. Just, I guess you could have. I don't. I don't know if it's complex. Maybe it could be described as complex. When you know, electric fields and magnetic fields are connected to mm. each other. Yeah. And in special relativity. Um, people can see one or the other. You know, like, depending on how fast you're moving relative to someone else. Okay. Um, because they're very related phenomena. And so, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But maybe there is a way you could construct that mathematically so that... Right, I yes. don't. I don't know. That's a weird. So that's like your fridge magnets all of a sudden turn into I don't even know what charged plates. Is that what's going on at that point? I don't know. Do they fall off the I, fridge? I didn't really. Didn't gel with special rail. Yeah. Well, yeah, bits of it, yeah, but bits of it now. I just and I've reused that area of memory. Really, <laughs> you saved over that. Too yeah. Many times. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, so magnetic fields, yes. I think you asked me a question and I now haven't answered it. Well, I guess I was just thinking if you've got this magnetic field going round and round and round, getting further and further stretched, right, you can't break magnetic field, right? So does it just sort of disappear? Because I guess you can turn off a magnetic field. Like, you know, like with an electromagnet, say, there isn't a magnetic field. You turn it on, there is. Yes, I'm trying to imagine the magnetic field which is very difficult for someone with no visual imagination. Because um, it's going round and round, and it's getting stretched further and further round. Does it then sort of recede into the star as new magnetic field right. areas are Sorry. becoming? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason why it has to stay at the same distance from the star. Right, OK. Absolutely, yeah. It gets... It gets, you know, um, reconsumed, if you like, <laughs> back into the star. And also field lines can, you know, kind of be pushed out pretty much to infinity. Right. You know. Make it some other star's problem. Yeah. Fair. Um, so we don't need to worry too much about it. The star isn't going to, the sun isn't going to break Anytime soon. No. Or something. No. Okay. It's, it's quite middle happy aged with its magnetic and happy. field. It's, it's, a, not, it's not. It's not about to have like a mid 
midlife magnetic crisis or something. No. Okay. I don't even know what that would really... I don't know, but it sounded kind of scary. Yeah. So that's the photosphere that you were talking about then, with all of its crazy with the different surface. days. So, yeah. Um, so how many... I mean, I, I don't know, with the Earth's atmosphere, there seems to be like 10 million <laughs> different things. And I'm like, yeah, that's in the atmosphere. Um, are there lots of different regions of the stellar atmosphere? Or is it just like the photosphere is the atmosphere? What's beneath it? What's above it? Yeah. Um, yeah, the Earth seems to have a lot. It feels like every time I look, they add another one. I think that's just because I'm ignorant. <laughs> I think that's just because I'm forgetting the ones. <laughs> and they also sound the same, which doesn't help. They're all sounding spheres. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, so the sun's interior is generally quoted as, you know, being made up of seven different regions. Okay. So That's even worse than our atmosphere. <laughs> true, but this also includes the the interior of the sun, not what you might describe as its atmosphere. Okay. So, you know, the, the same as the Earth has has an interior. When you think of that picture that they always draw... They cut it out. They cut it out and it looks like some sort of weird spherical cake. Yes. Yeah. You can do the same with the sun. Yeah. So inside, in the very centre, you have the core. We've got a core. Just like ours, yeah. Then you have the radiative zone. Um, That sounds like the worst part of the crystal maze. (laughs) And then outside of that, you have the convective zone. Okay. And those two regions are named after how energy is transported right, throughout okay. them. So in the radiative zone, energy is transferred from the bottom of the zone, at, you know, mm-hmm. at the core, up to the convective zone through radiation. Yeah. And the next zone... Is when energy is transported throughout the zone by convection. Mm. So, the you know, if you think of, like, your your room the heat, the hot air mm. rises up and the cold air is therefore pushed down. And this, you know, process continues and that's how heat gets from the bottom of the room to the top of the room. Also works for cups of tea or coffee. Yeah. Yeah. The top and bit of your coffee stays hot, the bottom bit gets cold. Yeah. Yeah, also happens because you have a toddler and you have to abandon your coffee, but yeah. <laughs> the, the other <laughs> method of heat transfer... <laughs> Um, so that's that's the convective zone. Um, then you reach the photosphere, which we talked about. It's kind of you know the surface of the, of the sun. Um, and then after that is the chromosphere. And those two are named after basically the the kind of light that you can see coming from them. So if you look at the sun, you can see into it. <laughs> Mm. Into all, you know, all the way into the inside by looking at different wavelengths of light. Yes. And so you could name different sections based on how you can see it, what wavelength you use to see it, if you see what I mean. After that comes the transition zone, which I hesitate because some people think shouldn't really be a thing, but. I've included it here anyway. And after that comes the corona. Okay, so basically, so some people think you've got the chromosphere and then there's like a kind of gap. Is that what's going on? Or no, there, I there's, think there's just like... You can't really draw a line. about easily. how you should define right. things. Yeah. Again, back to categorising things yeah. and drawing a line in things and it's like, eh, it's kind of hazy. Yeah. And probably different people want to define things differently because it suits them yeah in the, for their research and science things. yeah okay. so yeah the corona is kind of what you might think of as the atmosphere of the sun really so the outer bit is the corona yes the crown yes um, which people know now thanks to do. the virus yeah people well not everyone but a lot of people know that that's the the definition of the etymology of that word is crown yeah it it's the crown of the the sun. Um, it gives it that kind of stereotypical 
um, wavy edge, mm -hmm. which is pretty popular in kids' cartoons. I drew like one the of them for the toddler just the other day. Yeah. I um, feel like they're pretty common in like little cartoons of the sun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're what you see if you're lucky enough to see an eclipse, a total eclipse. Um, and they're absolutely spectacular. You can see, you know, even if you just looked at an image on Google, mm. you, you can see the corona around the outside of the sun that doesn't get covered up by, by the eclipse. It's kind of hazy. Yeah. Yeah, very pretty. Mm. So we've talked about how big the sun is in terms of its size. We talked about how old it is, middle-aged, doing well. Um, we've talked about time on the sun. we talked about all the bits that make up the sun. Mm -hmm. But how hot is the sun? Well, how hot it is depends on where in the sun you are. Oh. So, if you're in the core... It's 15 million degrees C, 27 million F. In the radiative zone, um, it's 7 million degrees C, which is 12 million Fahrenheit. I mean, going back to saying we don't know what 28G really means, I have no idea what 7 million degrees C yeah. is, but it's hot. Yes. The convective zone is about 2 million degrees C, three and a half million degrees Fahrenheit. By the time you get to the photosphere, it's about five and a half thousand degrees C. So maybe that's more comprehensible. I don't know. Um, which is about 10,000 Fahrenheit. I reckon you can probably think that's when certain things melt or something at that point. You know. Yeah, you probably could look Starting for what would melt at that point. Somewhat close. Okay, so we're going, um, we're going When you get down. to the corona... It's about 1 million degrees C. Okay, now you're wrong there because, you see, you start off at the core with 15 million. Yeah. And you've been getting, you've been getting smaller because you've been getting further away from the core. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and at Earth, it's even cooler than 5,500 degrees C. So. Yes, thankfully. Um, you're further out and you're wrong. Sorry. Sorry to bust your science, <laughs> but um, no, I'm you can't, it can't be a, a million degrees C. I'm not wrong. <laughs> um, you have stumbled across the coronal heating problem. An unsolved problem of physics, which of which there are many, right? But it's a very famous one in that it's been going on a long time. For a long time, we've known the photosphere is... Yeah, you know, cool, relatively speaking. I wouldn't say five and a half thousand degrees C is cool, but for the sun, it's pretty cool. You get to the corona, which is further out, and it's suddenly one million degrees again. It, 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 so not only does it not make sense, it really doesn't make sense. Yes, I think every solar and stellar physicist out there would agree with you. Why are we not putting more research into this? There is a lot of research <laughs> going on into it. Not um, enough. Not enough. Probably because no one is funding, not enough people are funding it. I don't know. We don't know why it does this. But there are a couple of potential answers, neither of which currently fits the bill perfectly or has been completely... There hasn't been an accepted solution yet if you see what i mean yes presumably whoever solves this problem will be looking at a nobel prize because it's been you going so. on a long time and um it's a pretty big problem mm. <laughs> because it goes to show that our understanding of physics is is insufficient um you know because we can't explain why why is the sun hotter further out from the sun than it is closer to the sun? Yeah. You know? And so um, it's not like it's twice as hot, right? Because And, you know, mm -hmm. with, with temperatures in Celsius, it doesn't quite work. But at this 
uh, this size of temperature, it basically does work because it's, you know, Kelvin minus 273. Mm -hmm. So it's basically 200 times yeah. as hot. Mm -hmm. That's not possible. Well, it's possible because it happens. <laughs> Somebody needs to go and tell the sun to sort itself out. Um, yeah, I think the answer is we need to sort ourselves out and understand why. Some people have um, proposed that it might be to do with alpha waves, which are, um, you know, if you think of sound waves as a way that information and energy is passed along through material for example you know like the air okay i was going to ask does the air count as material water or wood or whatever yeah. alpha waves are a way of passing information and energy along magnetic field lines right and so it could be related to them Okay. The, uh, uh, carrying energy from further down in the sun to higher up and then dumping it into the corona. So does that happen via, like, particles, like charged particles slowing up the magnetic fields, or...? No. No. <laughs> they are waves in the magnetic field. Right. So scary magnet things that don't make sense. So it's kind of like a... Well, what's it called? Isn't there like a... Oh, it's like um, one of those induction cookers. Like a hob where the magnets vibrate backwards and forwards and the magnetic field makes your pot warm up. I don't really know how induction cookers work, but I highly doubt it's to do with alpha waves. I just wonder if the sun's a giant induction hob for the corona. Okay. It's all for the day. Well, why don't you go and propose that to your <laughs> local astrophysics journal and, and see what experts think. Okay. I've had enough of experts. <laughs> right. Um, another potential solution is that it could be to do with magnetic reconnection and nano-flaring. So magnetic reconnection is what happens when field lines have to instantaneously change shape. Okay. Um, <laughs> instantaneously? Yes. Um, so if you have two field lines crossing over each other in a certain way or, or coming together in a certain way, mm. they can swap with each other. Oh, that's kind of neat. Um, and that's called magnetic reconnection. Um, Nano-flaring? That sounds almost like some kind of fashion trend. Well, flares are intense bursts of energy and light that come from the surface of the sun. Yeah. And a nano-flare would be a small one of those. And if you had... The, the idea is if you had lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of these nano flares, then the energy would add up to be right. so, significant. So is it basically like we know that energy can be chucked out by flares, but we don't see this happening enough to do that. Mm -hmm. So they must be so small that mm -hmm. it heats it up. Is that kind of the idea? Yes. And is that kind of similar with alpha waves and that we know that alpha waves exist? Mm -hmm. we? So, yeah. therefore, that could be a thing. Um, and the magnetic reconnection, we know that exists? Yeah, we know but magnetic reconnection is a thing. Do we the, know that none makes of the, energy? None of these... These suggestions are not, you know, crazy wild cards. Right, OK. They're things that we know happen. We know that they exist. The, the question is, how do they move enough energy from within the, within the mm. sun to the corona? How yeah. do they move enough? Is it possible for them to move enough? Is it realistic that they could move enough? Mm. 
is the reality that it's actually a combination of events? Yeah, all not? three of them adding together. And so um, on. No one knows. Hmm. If I was a betting person, I think I'd put my money on Alpha Noids. Well, everybody at home, go down to Labbrook's <laughs> or other betting agencies Please that don't, are available. Please don't. Don't. Ask don't if they've do it got. On me. <laughs> ask if they've got any odds on the cause of the coronal heating problem. Uh, maybe put like ten p on it or something. You never know. Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's just it's not. Neither of them answer the question sufficiently yet. Neither of them answer the question as a reality. Um, we we don't know maybe the answer is something that's neither of these two things mm. I just feel kind of I don't know if intuitively is the right word you know because I'm not this isn't my research so it's not like I spend all day every day thinking about the coronal heating problem Although you don't that would wake be, up in the middle of the night would be kind of fun but unfortunately that's not what I get paid to do I don't know, I feel like it might be one of those things where it's like really fun to start with and then after a while you're like, you've been stuck on this crossword for like... For ever. hundreds of years. <laughs> like, Exaggeration. Uh, but... Nothing new, there's no new pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I just, I just kind of feel, I just feel like that's where I would... You're magnetically drawn towards it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it might not be either of these, it might be something else, it might be a combination... And I don't know when we'll know the answer. I hope that we'll know the answer during my lifetime. You know, I would really like to see this problem solved. I'd like to know the answer. I'm sure a lot of people would like to know the answer. I feel like that's one of those... It's an odd thing, because I don't think I've ever heard of the coronal heat, heating problem. But is a mystery of the universe is actually just, like, next door. Yeah. Do you know what it's like? Yeah. It's not... We don't need to go too far away. We've talked about exoplanets and things. We don't need to talk about somewhere outside of our solar system to be mm. like, we just don't understand. We don't the understand. laws of physics yeah. don't allow, as we understand them, as For it were. this to happen, and yet it happens. You know, because there's a lot of stuff in the solar system that makes us realise we don't understand stuff. But, yeah, it's one of the problems where it's particularly interesting and humbling because it's like our understanding of the laws of physics do not permit this. Mm. You know, it's not just like we don't understand how we haven't cracked the problem on how this, you know, planet came to be how it is or or whatever. It's like more fundamental than that. Yeah. You know, and that's what makes it so interesting. I feel like that's something as well, you know, people really like quantum and black holes because it's like sort of, not even necessarily like mystery, but just like intriguing, as it were. Mm -hmm. But you know, just something being hotter by a long way than it should be. It just feels just so simple. Mm. You know, that's the thing about it. It feels like we should be able to understand that. Yeah, it's just temperature. Yeah. You know, it's... it shouldn't be this complicated, and yet. And yet, it appears it, it is this complicated. So it's middle age now. Yes. What, what's, what's old age got in store for it? It's kind of difficult to define age. Well, not necessarily, not age is in the number. Mm, it's how young you feel inside. Um, but I suppose, you know, I've assigned it the, the title of middle age. In that it's kind of middle-aged through this part of its life, which is most of its life. Okay, right, yes. Um, stars start off, you know, as a whole bunch of things, become like a proto-star, which is something that's going to be a star. Then they're like, eventually they, they become something that's called a pre-main sequence star. Is that pre-main sequence or yes. pre-main sequence i'm not sure what the difference is there but... right um i mean you would write it pre hyphen main okay sequence star but it's more but like, it's like pre hyphen pre brackets main, main sequence, sequence. Star. 
Um, okay. And that's basically, it's pretty much a star, but it's not quite finished forming into its final state, if you like. Mm. Um, then it becomes a main sequence star, and this is most of its life right. being on main sequence. So the point that we defined that as you're on the main sequence now? Yes, when it stopped contracting. Oh. Okay, so this is now about the size it's going to be. Yes. At that point, when it starts, when it hits main sequence, mm. it's zero age main sequence. Okay. That's when it's zero. Right. So, so it's been around for a while, but now it's zero. Yeah. yeah. Because it's, you know, that's when it's like, it it's now like a baby. It's been born, if you yeah. like. You know? Yeah. Um, so when you said before that it was, however, one point, no. Yeah, 4.5 billion years old. That is from when it... From zero age main sequence. Right, okay. That's how you age stars. Okay. So. Okay. It's middle-aged in terms of its main sequence lifetime. Right. When that finishes, it gets to the end. Mm. That's like at the end of its its life, if you like. Mm-hmm. It'll become a red giant. Right. So it starts to expand in size and it gets quite red. And it, you know, it's going to ins- expand in size a lot. So it, it'll engulf quite a lot of the inner solar system. Um, Venus, maybe even Earth, going to be swallowed up. That was an episode of Doctor Who. And yes, it was. With Lady Cassandra. I think it might be the second episode of the new series. Is. Yeah. Eventually. It's going to blow off its outer shell. Okay. And that's going to go off into space. Only the core's going to be what's left at that point. And the outer shell creates what is often called a planetary nebula. Okay. Kind of looks like a nebula, you know, around the star, mm-hmm. kind of. Um, all the the remains of that shell that no longer as a part of the star. And the core becomes a white dwarf, which is very hot, very small, very dense. It's no longer fusing, you know, hydrogen, helium, whatever anymore. It's not fusing. Is it made of... Has it still got hydrogen left? Or is this... Not really, no. Okay, so it's now... It's beyond fusion, so now it's just really hot from being hot. It's really hot from its... Gravity oh, okay. collapsing, basically. Okay. The gravitational collapse and the the gravity it already had from being a core and everything mm. is, you know, gives it a lot of energy. It has a lot of energy. And then there's also a lot of leftover heat as well from, from all the fusion that had been going on. Right. So previously, gravity had a lot of pressure, etc., mm-hmm. which led to fusion at the core of the star. And now that energy is still there, but it can't fuse. Mm-hmm. So instead it just lets out. As, it's now just heat. Yes. So it's no longer fusing. It's just emitting thermal energy. So it's just emitting the heat that it, that it already contains. Is that why it's a white dwarf? Is it just is it Cause it's emitting really white, white hot? Energetic, yes. Um, and that's pretty much it for it. Okay. Eventually, it'll run out of energy. It'll have emitted all of it, and it's going to cool. Right. And that'll be it. What does it become then? Is that then like a black hole? No. Black holes come from collapse of very big stars. Okay. Um, the the dwarf won't do anything at that point. It's got nothing else to do. It's got no energy. It's got it can't do anything. It might become what's called a black dwarf. Okay. I say that because we don't know if they exist yet. Okay. They're still theoretical. It's kind of hard to find something that doesn't emit any light at all. Yeah, I can see doesn't that. Doesn't have any heat. Or a car, doesn't probably. really do anything. Yeah. Isn't really very big. Probably not interacting with anything. 
Mm. Um, it's just that the white dwarf is no longer emitting any light, so it would look black. So I guess also, so you got like a, well, I was going to say, you've got a white dwarf, and then it when it's lost all of its energy, as it were, it's become a black dwarf. Does that mean there's a grey dwarf in the middle? But then you, if you were just looking at it, you might think that's a white dwarf that's just not very. Yeah, they powerful. just they just fade. They will, or they will fade. There hasn't been enough time passed in the universe for a white dwarf to have lost, to have lost all, of, all its... of its energy yet. Right. As it cools down, does it just get less intense, or does it change color? You know, does it start to go like blue then? Orange, then red, whatever. Um, In a yes. kind of black body radiation kind of way. Yes. Okay. So that just about wraps things up for this episode. Please, can we encourage you to subscribe to Through the Telescope wherever you find your podcasts, and if you like, you can leave us a nice positive review as well. It really helps the show and it makes it easier for more people to find us. Feel free to send us any comments, questions, or suggestions of things or people you'd like to hear about or from in future episodes. Or perhaps to put yourself forward to chat about your own astro research or experiences. As always, you can find us on Instagram at Through the Telescope Podcast, or you can find me at astrophysicist underscore rose. You can also find us on Twitter at The Telescope Pod. And you can contact us by email at through the telescope podcast at gmail.com. And with that, we'd like to thank you very much for listening, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye. Bye.